to Computer Architecture. My name is Dr. Karen Mazzidi. I've been a teaching professor at the University of Texas at Dallas since 2016. Each semester, I teach multiple sections of computer architecture. I also teach machine learning and natural language processing courses. The term computer architecture seems strange to me when I first heard it because I immediately thought of big buildings. The term architecture is from a Greek word meaning chief creator and refers to both the process of planning, designing, and constructing structures. The architects of these buildings had very different techniques and raw materials. More importantly, they had very different purposes for the things they created. Likewise, architects of computers make different choices depending on the purpose of the computer they're building whether it's a supercomputer, a personal computer, or a small embedded system. Despite the differences in scale, similar design principles apply up and down the size spectrum and across the decades of computer design. Let's take a quick look back at machines from the past to better understand where we are today. The first mainframe computers were created for military purposes. A great book to read is Colossus, which recounts early mainframe development in World War II by the British to decrypt German messages. After World War II, mainframes were expanded to general purpose use. And it may surprise you to know that they're still used by very large organizations. The cost of mainframes was prohibitive, so many manufacturers created many computers, more affordable computers for business. The prevalence of mini computers declined in the mid 1980s due to the PC. When PCs were introduced in the early 1980s, they weren't very useful. For example, a typical IBM PC with an Intel 8086 chip may have had only 256K of main memory. Today, personal computers are very powerful. Devices have become smaller and smaller, but more powerful. We now hold enormous computing power literally in our hands. Microcontrollers are smaller than the microprocessors in our laptops and are typically part of an embedded system. Examples of embedded system include video game controllers and household appliances. New cars have an estimated 50 microcontrollers or more, controlling everything from airbags to anti-lock brakes. When we connect these devices to the internet, we have the internet of things. At the other end of the size and power spectrum are supercomputers, sometimes called exascale computing. This is a computer being built for the Department of Energy. A recent trend is cloud computing. Instead of building their own data centers, companies rent virtual machines in the cloud. And rather than distribute software via download, Many companies have gone to a software-as-a-service model. All of these devices have a CPU, a central processing unit. A microprocessor chip, such as we have in our personal computers, connects to memory and peripherals via buses. In contrast, a microcontroller, sometimes called a system on a chip, has memory, peripheral ports, and everything all on a single chip. These are typically used in embedded systems. But similar design principles apply to microprocessors and microcontrollers. CPUs have internal memory and also interface with external memory. This chart from our textbook shows recommended usage of these terms. Notice that anything that ends in byte is in a power of 10, and anything that ends in b byte is in the power of 2. Perhaps more important than having CPUs and memory in common, computing systems in recent years have been inspired by different ideas. The authors of our textbook have observed the following eight great ideas that have transformed the computing industry over the past few decades. The first and more important is Moore's Law. In 1965, Gordon Moore predicted that the number of transistors that would fit on a chip would double every one and a half to two years. This prediction became a goal and then it became a reality. So what's a transistor? Think of it as a tiny electronic switch. All computer circuitry is constructed from transistors. 
Memory is also constructed from transistors. The second principle is abstraction. Abstraction helps us design things by pushing detail to the side. An example of hardware abstraction is looking at a block diagram to give us the big picture of what's going on. An example of software abstraction is something like int j equals 5. This abstracts away from the ones and zeros of the storage. The third principle is to make the common case fast. In order to make a CPU more efficient, you should optimize the instructions that are executed more often. An analogy is your morning routine. You should optimize the morning routine for your typical day, not the unusual day. An important trend in computer design is parallelism, which lets us do many different things at the same time, or do the same things on different processors. Pipelining is an assembly line type of technique for instructions being executed in the CPU. Prediction speeds up processing. Rather than waiting to be sure about the next instruction, we'll go ahead and predict which instruction to execute next. Then if it's wrong, we can fix it. Processing is supported by the memory hierarchy, having many different types of memory at different levels with different access speeds and different costs. Redundancy leads to dependability. For example, having redundant servers keeps things flowing if a few of them fail. Some of these eight great ideas may be unfamiliar now, but they're common themes that we'll revisit throughout the course. This course takes a peek under the hood at what's really going on when we execute programs. The ISA, or Instruction Set Architecture, is the set of instructions that a CPU can execute. The CPU executes the ones and zeros, the machine code. What we're going to learn is the next abstraction from that, which is an assembly language. We'll also look at abstractions of hardware. We're not going to actually look at physical hardware, more we'll look at the concepts of hardware design, but the first chapter of our book does take a peek inside the hardware. If you open the cover of an iPad 2, not recommended, you'll see this logic board. The red box highlights the A5 ARM processor, and other chips are memory chips and controllers for I.O. and power. Zooming into the A5, we see more details. We see that there are actually two cores within this processor. Zooming even smaller, we can see transistors with an electron microscope. The chip manufacturing process starts with silicon ingots, slices them into wafers, then they go through many processing steps to become patterned wafers. Each of the little squares in the patterned wafer has the potential to become a chip. The last decades have witnessed unprecedented innovation in how we use technology. Every day, new inventions enter the market and change our lives. Competition is fierce to be the first to have the best ideas and implementations. Computers of all types enable this creative expression of our human potential. This is one of my favorite quotes from the book Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. Computer science is not a science, and its significance has little to do with computers. The computer revolution is a revolution in the way we think, and in the way that we express what we think. I hope that you've already discovered not only how intellectually challenging computer science can be, but also how rewarding it is from a creative point of view. So you may be wondering if people still use assembly language. Yes, for real-time and other system applications. So why learn an assembly language? You'll become a better programmer. You'll finally understand what you're doing, and you'll be able to write more efficient code. This class will get you beneath the abstractions to the ones and zeros. I also like this quote from Peter Norvig. He says, here at Google, sometimes they just throw things together. But other times, when you have billions of users, it's important to be efficient. A 10% improvement in efficiency can work out to billions in dollars. And in order to get that last level of efficiency, you have to understand what's going on all the way down. In this course, you're going to understand what's going on all the way down. Speaking of ones and zeros,
The next video will review binary, decimal, and hex representations.